That's the very uh, first episode of the first season, sort of getting you introduced to the family and what they do. And, and they are unashamed about part of what they do is make money. And I have no idea how much money they're making, but I'm, it's a pretty big pile of it right about now. Uh, I know my, my brother-in-law um, actually did a book signing of, uh, with, with, Miss Kay, with Miss Kay at one event um, and found out through a series of people he knows that the, the appearance fee to get one of the brothers to come to a, an event to speak is $80,000 now, just to, just to show up once to give a talk. So we were looking at bringing them in here. That, that's, that's a little stretch for us uh, right now. In George We Trust, the gospel of money, let's look at uh, Matthew 6, 24. This comes out of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaching, and he talks about this issue of money. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, we read that verse, and a lot of you have seen it before, and it's easy to read that and then kind of assume that because Jesus says you can't serve God and money, that maybe he's kind of saying that money is evil or bad. Uh, we see a Japanese pitcher sign a contract for $155 million before he's ever played a single game in the major leagues. Or we see a luxury box at the Super Bowl goes for over $1 million for one game, and we say, no one's worth that kind of money. That's crazy. And someone will shake their head and say, well, you know, money is the root of all evil. But actually, that's one of the most misquoted verses in the entire Bible. 1 Timothy 6.10 really says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. In fact, a number of Jesus' parables, his stories with a spiritual point, involve money. They involve people investing money for profit. And he never condemns money or people who have or earn money. He does, however, have a lot to say about money. I want to back up a little bit from what Jesus says here. We'll come back to it at the end of today's uh, talk and get a little bit of a biblical perspective on money, and in particular, the relationship between our work and money. From cover to cover, the Bible affirms that work is to produce profit. Work produces profit. When one of our boys was about five years old, years ago, uh, I was out, I think, just mowing the grass, doing some yard work. And I looked up while I'm mowing the grass, and he comes walking out of the garage carrying a broom. He's about five. And he's going along behind me, and he's sweeping up grass clippings off the sidewalk, off the driveway, just sweeping them back into the yard. I'm thinking to myself, oh, look at that. Chip off the old block. Got that mowing the grass gene in him. He, I, I was really proud of him. You know, he's, he's just working like crazy, just sweeping up. It was easy. He could, he could sweep the grass up. I finished the, the, doing the yard, and he's finishing up his little job. I walk up to him and say, hey, man, thanks for your help. He goes, you owe me five bucks. He's like five years old. He had already learned by age five that money is necessary and that you have to work in order to earn money. That's not bad to learn that. We all want our kids to learn the connection between hard work and earning money. Go way back in the Deuteronomy chapter 8 in the Old Testament, we read this. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Fascinating verse, way back in the history of Israel. Not only is producing wealth uh, good, it's actually a gift from God, and it's in some way confirming His promise, confirms His covenant to provide for and to deliver His people. In incredibly interesting connection between producing wealth and God's covenant. Now, throughout the Bible, we see all kinds of references to people who earned, invested, or possessed money and wealth. We see it in, the, in, in sort of a sidebar to what we see the, the story of the, uh, being revealed to us. We see people had money. For example, Job, one of the oldest books of the Old Testament and a story that's really about understanding human suffering in the context of our experience. But in the way of t on the way toward telling Job's story, we find out he's very wealthy. The Bible says Job possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And then it says this, so that this man was the greatest of all the peoples of the East. He was a man of extraordinary wealth. And the Bible makes no comment about his wealth, just that he had great wealth and was a righteous man. King Solomon of Israel, renowned for his wealth, renowned for his wisdom, is the author or the originator of most of the Proverbs that we have, as well as the book of Ecclesiastes that we've leaned on in this year's curriculum. Also known for his, um, his appetite for women, just to put it 
bluntly. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines, which God eventually takes him to task for. But Solomon is well known. But he's also incredibly wealthy. The Bible said he received as king 25 tons of gold every year as tribute from other kings around him. 25 tons of gold every year. I did the math on that. That's $1.3 billion a year in our in today's currency rates and exchange rates for gold, uh, just in tribute, without doing anything else. That's a lot of money. It was so much money that he had his place settings at his, at his um, palace made of pure gold. Goblets and forks and knives were pure gold. That's rich. He said, you know, I've seen that Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal has a garage that can hold 35 cars, a two-level garage. That's nothing. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for chariots and 12,000 horses. I mean, Shaq's like a pauper compared to King Solomon, right? And it never comments on his wealth. It never says that's a bad thing. It's what he does with his wealth that God comments on. On the other end of the spectrum, in the New Testament, we see Paul the Apostle, who we know was a tent maker. That is, he wanted to support himself, even as he ran around the ancient world building, uh, planting churches and preaching the gospel. He didn't want to be dependent, so he made tents. He had a trade that he used to make money to support his ministry. Jesus was a carpenter his adult life until he started his public ministry. And when he started his public ministry, he was then supported by other people of means who had work and income and supported his ministry. All that to say that money is never the issue in Scripture, money is not the issue. In fact, the ability to work and earn profit to create wealth is a gift from God. So money's not bad. Wealth is not bad. But money is powerful, and wealth can be dangerous. That's why Jesus has a lot to say about it. That leads us to the second point today. Jesus is teaching us that money is a rival to God. Money can be a rival to God. There's a well-known story, and I've talked about it before, about a woman who lived way back at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, named Henrietta Green. Uh, Henrietta Green was uh, uh, one of the early investors in uh, Wall Street and in railroads and in um, uh, bonds, and she became the wealthiest woman in America at that time in our history. In fact, her nickname was the Witch of Wall Street. There's a movie out now called The Wolf of Wall Street, where she, she was prior to this, that guy. She was the witch of Wall Street. Partly she was named that because of how she dressed. Uh, she was so frugal that she wore one black dress her whole life until that one wore out, and then she wore another black dress. And partly because of her miserliness. She was legendary for her stinginess, even though she was the wealthiest woman in America. She was said never to turn on the heat in where she lived or to use hot water because it used money. She didn't wash her hands with soap because she saved by not using soap. She rolled, rode around in an old carriage even though she could afford a new one. Uh, she conducted much of her business at the bank where she did her business because she didn't want to pay for her own office space. And the bank couldn't kick her out because she had so much money. She'd just bring all her papers in, set up her shop right there in the bank. Uh, later, uh, there were rumors that she ate only oatmeal during her life, heated on the office radiator where she worked. When her son Ned broke his leg as a child, she tried to disguise herself and have him admitted into a free clinic for the poor because she didn't want to pay for a doctor. That eventually led to uh, him getting poor treatment. She was recognized. She, ran, she delayed getting treatment to pay for it. Finally, he ended up having part of his leg amputated and wearing a prosthesis for the rest of his life. In other words, Henrietta Green worshipped money. Money was the, by far the most important thing in her life, more important even than her son's health. So money had become, in a sense, her God, small g. So when Jesus says you cannot serve God and money, that's what he's talking about. He actually gives money a name. If you read it in the ancient language, money has a name. It's mammon, like, he, like an idol would have a name. He said you can't worship both God and the idol of money. Now what did he mean by that? Let me read another story to you that comes out of Mark chapter 10, the story of the rich young ruler. I didn't put all these texts on the screen. It would take too many screens. But let me read it for you. You'll recognize the story, and it illustrates our point here. In Mark 10, we read this story. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. That's a good start. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's the central question of all human existence. What's my eternal destiny? What's my spiritual destiny? How do I get there? Uh, and so he clearly had heard something about Jesus, knew something about Jesus' teaching on the kingdom of God. However, Jesus also knows something about this man, either by how he's dressed, how he approaches, from knowing him from around town, or better yet, knowing what's in his heart. Because the Bible tells us gee, Jesus could discern what was in someone's heart. Here's Jesus' response. Why do you call me good? 
Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Boom. Guy gives himself away. All these I have kept since I was a boy. Really? All of them? Every single one? He's saying to Jesus, actually, I'm a pretty good guy. I deserve eternal life based on how good I am. Jesus knows the man is proud and self-righteous. So Jesus looks at him, Scripture says, and loved him. He says, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now what's Jesus saying there? Is he saying we all have to give away everything we have to the poor? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. We know that from other places in Scripture. He's saying that because he knows what grips this young man's heart. We see in the next verse, At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. So imagine that. You're standing in front of Jesus himself. You got a chance to ask one question. He gives you one answer. No can do. Turn around and walk away. It's one of the saddest stories in all of Scripture. And he went away because he had great wealth. See, Jesus knew who this man's God had become. He knows there's only room in our hearts for one God. That's how we're built. There's only room for one God. And he's challenging this man to get rid of the imposter so the real God can take his, his place. That's why Jesus says this to this man. Finish the story. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples who are watching this, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. Now, why were they amazed? Well, because their assumption was the man was rich because God had blessed him. He was already inheriting eternal life. They saw that as a sign of God's blessing. Jesus says, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? In other words, if that guy can't be saved, what, what hope there is for any of us? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, that's, this is impossible, but, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Now, we talked a few weeks ago about the human need to worship. Human beings are created to worship. God set eternity in our hearts. We have to worship something. We can't help from worshiping any more than we can help from breathing air. We worship something. Something always takes the top slot in our hearts. Always. And we have this tendency to build idols, to give extravagant devotion to that which is not God. Okay, we talked about the idol of accomplishment, building the Tower of Babel way back in Genesis. Let's make a name for ourselves, people said. Some of the players and coaches in this year's Super Bowl are making an idol out of that game, out of that ring that they could win. If they make an idol of it out of that ring, they will soon find out, even if they win the ring, the ring doesn't fill, doesn't fill that spot. It doesn't. They'll have to get another one, and then another one, and then another one. Sometimes we make an idol out of work. Sometimes we make an idol out of sports. Super Bowl's a great example. Almost $100 million is going to be wagered this weekend on the Super Bowl. $100 million. Almost $10 billion is spent on Super Bowl-related stuff. Just sports. And probably the most common idol worship in our culture today is money. Money is a powerful thing. Wealth is kind of like a gravitational force. That's the way I've talked about it in the past. It bends everything in its direction. It bends our attention. We pay attention. We see the cars. We see the houses. We pay attention to wealth. It also tends to bend our own hearts. And with all the blessings and benefits that wealth brings, and it does, it's a gift, it also tends to create problems. Here's a few problems that wealth creates. We all know about them. The problem of greed when it comes to money, no matter how much we have, we still want more. I think every person has in their head a, a, a secret number. If I just had this much more, then I'd be happy. Then I'd be secure. Greed. I met a guy years ago. Um, we were trying to find, when we were looking for this property as a church back in the late 1990s, we were looking around. We tried to buy a piece of property in Geneva uh, where the old uh, mall was there at the, at the intersection of 38 and Randall. And the guy who owned it was a Chicago real estate investor, tough guy in the city. So another church leader and I went down to the city and tried to talk him into giving it to us for a really low price. And uh, as we talked with him, he eventually turned down our offer. But as we were walking, he knew I was a pastor. So as we're walking down and, uh, on the way to, uh, back from lunch, uh, he says, hey, I got a question for you. You're a pastor, right? I said, yeah. He goes, uh, he goes what do I do about this? How do I, how do I, uh, he was, he's wanted to, he told a story about a, a business associate of his that he'd gotten started in the business who then had backstabbed him on a deal. And he told this story, long story, and then he says, uh, he goes, what do I do with that? 
He goes, now, I know I'm greedy, he says. He says, I'm greedy. He goes, I, I know I'm greedy. I want to make as much money as I can, but I want everybody to make as much money as they can. He goes, but that guy, that guy was just selfish. <laughs> and I said, I've never quite heard that distinction before, but he was making this, it made some sense. You know, I'm greedy. That was just, a, that was just accepted, but that guy's selfish. In other words, he's greedier than me. Okay, so we had this interesting conversation about greed and forgiveness and that sort of thing. But greed is a problem. The problem of materialism. We know somewhere deep within us that money can't buy happiness or love. We know that. And still our behavior says something different. During the Super Bowl, we're going to see about 45 to 50 commercials. The going rate for a Super Bowl commercial this year for 30 seconds is $4 million. $133,000 a second. Why? They work. They work. They know they can influence our behavior. They can get us to buy stuff we don't need with money we don't have. That's how it works, materialism. Ultimately, the problem is worship. We are tempted to worship money. We see money as the source of our happiness, as the source of our security. We talk about financial security more than we talk about spiritual security. We see money as our hope. A lot of people see money as their salvation. But money, Jesus says, is a lousy God. Thirdly, we see today God gives purpose to our wealth. Back to the story of my son and the five bucks. You know, when he, I saw, I think I gave him the five bucks for working, even though I didn't have the contract set up with them. And that was on a Saturday, I think. The next day is Sunday. And back in those days, um, this particular boy would go with me early to church. We had just the East Campus, so we uh, d- drove over to, uh, to church, went to church, and after church, I would drive him home and to meet the rest of the family. So he jumps in my car, but we had this little habit that after church on a Sunday morning, we'd drive right across the street to what then was called the Pepper Valley Pantry, and I'd get him a, you know, a little candy bar or something. We just had a little tradition we did, the two of us. So we drove out after church, go over there before we go home. We walk in there, he gets, him, he gets himself, he's got this money in his pocket, you know, this $5 that's just burning the hole in his pocket. So he gets himself some Skittles, and we get up to pay for the Skittles, and he notices right there on the counter, there's a little uh, tube of these little plastic flowers. I mean, no, paper roses. They're paper, made out of paper, and they're like two fifty dollars each. And it's just like this impulse buy, you know, they're there. He looks at them, and he takes out one, puts it with the Skittles. So the Skittles are like, you know, 75 cents, and then the paper flower is like two fifty. dollars That's like 50% of his total net worth. You know, he puts out the five bucks. And I said, hey, 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 buddy, how, uh, how come you're getting that flower? And he goes, I want to give it to mom. And I said, <laughs> typical guy, I said, you sure you want to do that? That's like, that's like half your total money. <laughs> you know, what am I thinking right there? Because he takes that home. It makes me look good, right? Because the boy buys the flower. The mom passes that on to me. It, it's all good. But I'm arguing with him about his net worth because, he, you know, it's, it's just it's stupid. But the Bible teaches us that everything belongs to God. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. No wiggle room there. Everything belongs to God. Everything you are, everything you have, everything you ever will have already belongs to Him. It's only yours on loan. It's only mine on loan. We're stewards. And so the purposes of our wealth are threefold. The Bible says, first the purpose of our wealth is to honor God. Honor God with your wealth, Scripture says. How do we do that? We honor God with our wealth when we honor Him with, uh, by worshiping Him with our wealth. How do you worship God with your wealth? We'll talk more about this next week, but it's about giving back to God a portion of what He's already given to us. Sometimes people like me have made giving about the church. Your giving is not about the church. Your giving is about God, about what God is worth, how you honor God with your wealth. Secondly, we honor God by providing for our family. Back to the Bigger Barns uh, thing from a few weeks ago. I had some good questions come back into me through emails on Bigger Barns. Now, how big is too big? Does that mean we shouldn't save for the future? We shouldn't pl- how about college funds? Is that Bigger Barns? How mu- you know, all that question. Those are good questions. Uh, g- providing for your family includes, if we look at all of Scripture, providing for their daily needs, providing a home, providing sustenance, providing for their health, providing for their, for, for their future, planning ahead, retirement, re- saving, includes all those things. And most people who study this sort of thing teach a kind of uh, 80-10-10 principle. That is, uh, to honor God with your wealth, to provide your family reasonably, you live on 80% of your income, you give away 10% of your income, and you save or invest 10% of your income. A rule of thumb, 80-10-10. Uh, a lot of the financial planners work on that basis, and the only one of those numbers that should be adjusted down at any point in time is the 80% you live on. Live on 75%, live on 70%, that way you save more, that way you give more, but that's the basic outline. Provide for your families, and then share with others. 
share with others. We'll talk more about this next week. We, don't, we do not honor God with our wealth when we either, one, hoard our wealth for ourselves. Ecclesiastes talks about wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner. When we hoard our resources for ourselves, we build bigger barns without considering God, and we worship really the God of money. We do not honor God when we spend more than we have and we end up serving the God called debt. That's not why God gives us wealth. So between those two extremes, we can honor God by providing for our family, sharing with others, and honoring Him. 18th century preacher named John Wesley, founder of the Methodist movement, said this, Gain all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Pretty simple. Gain all you can, save all you can, give all you can. We'll talk more about that next week as we talk about work and generosity. Here's the questions I want you to deal with today around your table. A couple of these should be very interesting. First, how much did you earn per hour in your first job? A lot of talk today about minimum wage and all that sort of stuff. This will sort of date you how old you are, but how much did you earn per hour in your first job as a young boy or maybe in high school? Maybe what was the job? Secondly, have you ever accepted or turned down a job primarily because of the compensation offered? Have, for example, have you ever changed jobs for less money? Don't hear that very often, but maybe you have. Uh, if so, why did you make that decision? Have you ever taken a new job just because it offered more money? Just talk about that. Most of us have, have had both experiences. And then thirdly, if you get there, on a scale of 1 to 10, just come up with a number on top of your head, on a scale of 1 to 10, how satisfied are you with your income level, your savings, including retirement, your current level of debt, your current level of generosity. You don't have to give numbers on any of those things. I just want you to talk about your level of satisfaction. So take a moment. When it's quiet, just write down 4, 5, 8, 9, 4, 1, 10. And then that, that, that's the number you share and maybe why. You don't have to share the real numbers. Okay? Get some coffee, a donut, wrap you up right before 7 o'clock. <laughs>